Hello and welcome to episode 66 of the Arena Regulars podcast. I'm Zach. And I'm Jeff. And we're your source for weekly drunken Magic the Gathering Arena content. Yep, just regular dudes drinking some irregular beers and talking about Magic the Gathering, in particular MTG Arena. Yes, and this week we're talking about metagames. We don't talk about metagames that often, so this is going to be uh, this is going to be a, a nice one. Yeah, um, but it's for the format that is pretty much the only one I've been playing recently. So for once, I might feel qualified to speak about. Hey, there we go. Uh, <laughs> and that that format is standard, obviously. A uh, new standard is always really exciting and fun. Uh, so we're going to break down some of the decks that you've been seeing or haven't been seeing or should be playing or shouldn't be playing or, you know, all that stuff. But uh, first, each week we both bring a beer. We drink Jeff's, then drink mine, rate them on a scale of bronze to mythic, and choose the best for last. So with that, Jeff, what is on tap? <clears throat> all right. So I'm excited to announce that this week we are kicking off a- another tap takeover and... Mm. Finally, finally, we're doing a left field brewery. So this is a, a mainstay of the Toronto brewing scene. Uh, it was around in 2013 is when it started. It's kind of in the east end, and it's, it's called uh, left field. It's obviously baseball inspired. Um, like their logo is literally just a baseball. That's so cool. <laughs> um, do you want to tell everyone why it's taken us so long to do left field? So... Left field only cans their beers in the smaller 355 milliliter cans. And this is just one of those things where, you know, it costs the same price as a regular beer. That's, you know, the normal one that we're used to, the 475, 500 mils. And then we just, it just, it's hard for us sometimes. So finally, with Godspeed, we kind of broke that and we're like, you know what, we can do a small beer. And so now we're like, well, now that the cat's out of the bag, let's just do the brewery we've been waiting to do for so long. Yeah, so we got a whole bunch of left field brews coming up, and I felt like the best place to start was their Greenwood IPA. So as I mentioned, they're kind of out in the east end. I assume this is named after the subway station that is closest to them, because Greenwood is a subway station. Oh, see, I didn't even know that. I was thinking, like, <laughs> is that the name of, like, a bat, or, like, uh, is that, like, a, <laughs> yeah, something? Like a special technique in baseball. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> give him the Greenwood. The Greenwood swing, yeah. <laughs> No, I'm pretty sure it's just the subway station you would get off at to get their beer. Perfect. <laughs> this is an IPA. It's 6.3%. The can art uh, is green. It's green. Look at that. It's a green green can. Um, if you want to check out this can and the other can that we have uh, later this evening, uh, just go to our Instagram at Arena Regulars and check them out and leave us like a comment. Hello, printer talking. Um, that's just my printer in the background trying to <laughs> tell me that it wants to go to sleep. Um but anyway, go to our Instagram. You can check out all those uh, cans there. But before that, we have some magic news. Uh, so, Jeff, I know that we just had a set come out. So it's not really great to talk about new sets that we haven't, you know, where we're talking about Kamigawa. But mm -hmm. we did have a little bit of news about when um, Streets of New Capena is coming out. And... The only reason I want to bring this up is because we just found out about it and it's different than what we're used to. So normally when a set comes oh. out um, on Arena, the, the format will actually drop the same day or the day before the pre-release will happen in stores. They've decided they want to change this and the paper pre-release will happen a week before like, like it normally does. And then the set will come out on in paper and Arena and MTGO on the same day, as opposed to all the digital formats the week before the actual release. Interesting. I think this makes a lot of sense. It, uh, yeah, it definitely makes sense. <laughs> so that the pre-release is a pre-release, and then the set comes out on the same day, and it's not confusing. <laughs> right. I remember going to one pre-release. I don't even remember which one it was, because it was so long ago, but I'd already played the set so many times by the time I went to the pre-release. Yeah, and you're like, oh, okay, yeah, all these, these are all the good cards, that's the best one, all the stuff. <laughs> And yeah. you kind of like miss the pre-release experience completely. So I think this is a great way to put some emphasis on um, in-store gaming, which is really fun, but also, you know, keeping the the digital and paper community together a little bit more. And so that we are... Oh, yeah. to <laughs> totally makes sense. I mean, as a digital player, it feels like it's just coming out a week later. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, yes, it, it's true. But um, I, talking with my paper-only friends... 
uh, it feels a little bit worse where they're like, oh, I'm so excited for the set to come out. I'm like, I've already drafted like 10, 20 times. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's great. It's a I'm really good set. The next set, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, also, we have a set championship for Neon Dynasty coming up, not this weekend, but the following one, which is going to be Alchemy and Historic. So we'll probably talk about that after the actual championship happens. But this week, all about standard. Get those other formats out of here. Ugh. We're playing good old fashioned standard. Um, so Jeff, what uh, what are we doing this evening? Like, how are we gonna? How do we want to get into this? I say we just go by go by tiers. You know, we said we were gonna do a meta game analysis. Let's start with the best decks, the decks that everyone's gonna run into all the time on the ladder, and sort of work our way down. And we'll pepper in some comments maybe about how we feel personally about these decks. <laughs> uh, but the, the ranking will indicate uh, what we believe their relative strength to be at least. Yeah, yeah. So listen to the beginning of the episode. Later on, it gets to be all the fun decks. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's not completely true, but... Uh, <laughs> First business, then party. Exactly. Uh, for our mullet. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. What, what part of the true. mullet is it? Is it? How close to the business part are you, or are you the back where it's all that's party? Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I just see like a diagram. Dang, I haven't even had any beer. Yet. I know. There's like a diagram of somebody's mullet and it's like, you know, the top tier decks in the front and then you can see it going back. The um, try hards like pull arrow to the front. Of the yeah. Mullet. <laughs> All the, the jimmies are in the back. complain about people who play good decks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm well, like, how am I both of these people? <laughs> uh, Jeff, let's talk about probably one of the best decks or probably the best deck. In the, uh, the format. Yeah, so you can't talk about this st standard format without talking about Orzov. I mean, you could call it mid-range, you could call it control. People are kind of going either way on that because it's kind of a slower mid-range deck that looks to grind you out. Mm -hmm. Plays a lot of Planeswalkers, plays a lot of, plays some like sacrifice -y stuff, you know, Meat Hook Massacre, and often you'll see uh, some lists have been moving away for it from it but for a while you would see you know the eye twitch shambling ghast kind of package in here too mm -hmm. um it's just a deck with a huge power level really high power level and it's really adaptable so um we've seen it kind of dip a little bit and then when as new uh, decks enter the metagame and then it's always able to bounce back and adapt to those new decks and kind of put itself back on top so yeah, I think I'd agree that this is the probably the number one deck. Yeah, I actually played this list. Uh, I've also heard some people talk uh, say that it's like Orzov tokens, <clears throat> which mm -hmm. kind of not really. I think they're they're referring to like wedding announcement because that card's right pretty good. That's a good card. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like when did this card? When did everyone just realize this card was good? Because now it's everywhere. But... Yeah, I just <laughs> thought it was like a good limited card, and I was like, oh sweet, it's a bomb and limited. And right. nope, apparently it's playable and standard, and it's uh, it's good. It's a, it's a problem. A on the lot other side. of different decks too, yeah. Um, but also, you know, with the release of a Neon Dynasty, we had these sweet dragons that came out. Which, to be fair, I guess we have a t there's a ton of dragons in standard right now. But um, the the one thing that you're looking at all these dies triggers to dragons is that Vanishing Verse is like a really good card. <laughs> And so right. it's not really surprising that Orzov decks are able to feast on some of these like monocolored permanents. So, uh, yeah, it, it uh, doesn't really surprise me at all. And it, like you were saying how it has to, uh, it always starts trying to come back. <clears throat> the main enemy for this deck was like the, is it turns one? Um, and now this one seems, it's just really interesting. There's a lot of hand disruption, which I really like. Um, but it, it does seem like all the slots are so different that it mm -hmm. morphs around whatever's happening. So it seems like a good place to, to, to know a lot about because then whenever the, another best deck comes out, Orzov's going to kind of morph around how to kill that one. Um, so I'm, uh, I don't, I mean, it's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you love, you know, these grindy mid-range decks, this is the deck to get in on. Um, it's so interesting. So I played not this past weekend, but the weekend before I played in a standard event and Orzov was kind of the big bad, like everyone knew about it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and the next deck we're going to talk about, I would say was the breakout deck of that weekend. Um, but now this weekend that just came up, 
Orzov, there were two kind of big standard tournaments, and Orzov won them both. And it looks like it was the same list that won both tournaments. And the list looks nothing like the Orzov lists that were that I was playing against just a week before. Like, there's no more... This list in particular isn't playing the Sacrifice Package. It's playing Luminarch Aspirant and Silver Quill Sky Silencer instead as, like, a kind of aggro disruption package. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's playing no copies of the Wandering Emperor, um, which was everywhere, you know, when I was playing in the tournament. Wait, this uh, one is, though, Ram? Uh, wait, maybe it's not the exact same list then. I think the one I'm looking at... Oh, no, sorry. It is playing three copies. Yeah, you're right. Okay, that, that one really freaked me out, because I was like, wait, what? This card is so good. Okay, so that's at least the constant. You're going <laughs> to want a few copies of the Wandering Emperor. Um, but there's no... What's the card that lets you sack something to exile anything? Um, um, anyways, it's like a, a black and a white. You sack a creature, you get to exile any non land Oh, right can of... Cast um, it again later. Yeah, right of... Uh, maybe? Yeah. Anyways, I mean, without the sack package, I'm not seeing that anymore. But mm -hmm. that was a big part of the decks, you know, a week ago. Yeah, this is interesting. Like, I... Because I was playing with this. I did not do very well with this deck. Um, and I'm the kind of player that, like, sees it, wins a tournament. Or more more likely, uh, Jeff sent me the something about a tournament, and then I just picked the best <laughs> or the best the winning deck and played it. <laughs> that tends to be what happens. <laughs> um, it's a good strategy, man. <laughs> yeah, and then, um, you know, I had a you know, bit of a rough time. It's playing like three dress on the main board, which <clears throat> is very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Just because I guess the other decks, I wasn't thinking it would be a good option, but like looking at the rest of the tier one decks that we're going to talk about, you know, it actually seems like a, a good piece to main deck. I just would normally not really want to have that many duresses, but it yeah. also helped with the silver quill silence or just another hand. But, um, in any case, I don't think I play it very well, but I lose to this often. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think Duress is a weird one right now. Especially, you can even see here, um, they have like a Duress Humiliate split. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because almost every deck plays non-land cards, which makes Duress okay. But then a lot of them are reliant on creatures as well. Like the best cards in their decks are creatures. So it's like you're not getting to rest the thing you want to a lot of the time. So it makes it pretty good, but not a slam dunk. Yeah. Because like it's, it's rarely going to miss, which is the big downside, but it's also not going to snag their gold span right before they get to play it. Exactly. Which seems that, I mean, because they're also playing Concealing Curtains, which is, it just seems like mm -hmm. you, the deck wants to know what's going on in their opponent's hand. And then like on turn one, you want to know what you're dealing with. And then you can go from there. And that's almost what it feels like it's doing. It's like, hey, totally. one mana, look at your hand, hopefully snag something, and then go from there. But, uh, yeah, anyway, cool deck. I like, I just, you know, the Wandering Emperor. I, uh, I I took special note because, you know. I Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't even know what I thought this card was because I saw the five Planeswalkers. And I was like, <laughs> oh, they don't have it. <laughs> I, I just mean that or the, the Wandering Emperor was a uh, worth a slot that I had mentioned. So I Yeah, know. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you like that ability to just tune a deck to a metagame, this is perfect for you. Or if you love the ability to just look at the best deck online and find a really good list that is going to work well and is going to have answers to anything the format could throw at you, this is also the choice for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, but Jeff, you know, like you've, you've played this deck, this next one. And mm -hmm. you turned me more onto it. Um, but uh, do you want to introduce us to this? I think a lot of people know what it is, but uh, it's... Um... Yeah, by, by now you probably know about this deck. Yeah. But, uh, it wasn't that long ago that uh, this deck was under the radar. And it's the infamous Naya Runes deck. Mm. Um, if you've played any ladder, I'm sure you've played against this deck by now. Um, but the interesting thing is that the weekend that I played... I played in an alchemy tournament on Saturday, and I just took my, whatever, thrown-together Rakdos sacrifice deck, had a pretty good time, but the, um, I missed out on top eight, uh, and the person who ended up winning the tournament was playing Naya Runes, and I looked at their deck list, and I saw that 
there were no alchemy cards. Like, there were no cards in this deck list that weren't legal and standard, except one of the lands, right? <laughs> and so I decided to jump into a, this big standard tournament on the next Sunday, the next day, with their Naya Runes deck that I just swapped some standard lands in. And then I noticed, and I did fairly well. Same same thing, I got 5-2 five, five and two record again, just missed top 8. But a pretty good run. But I noticed somebody else who had a similar run had also, he, they had top 8 the day before. They were playing in the Alchemy event. And they obviously also noticed that this Naya Runes deck was standard portable and ported it over. And so in the end, there were like a handful of players in this tournament that all just stole this Naya Runes list and played it in standard. <laughs> and we all did fairly well. And then the next day, it was just all over the ladder. <laughs> it's awesome. I really like it. <laughs> and I mean, so I feel like this was something you know if you were watching the right streamers you could have known about this deck you know before anyone I had to get beaten by it in a tournament in order to notice it and play it the next day so it was like uh, but other people see, clearly already knew about it before I did so I'm not I'm not saying I started I'm saying like I caught on right before just in time to maybe play in a tournament where people weren't prepared for it yeah and and then you told me about it, so then I got excited because right. auras and standard, and I was like, "Oh, the first thing I want to do." All right, so here, where's the? Oh, where's wait? Where's light pause? There's no light pause. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it turns out light pause is terrible in this deck. I've played this <laughs> a lot. This is the main deck I'm playing in standard, and yeah. I uh, did add a light pause just to see what uh, I could I could do with it. Uh, turns out it's really bad. There's only a couple, you know, you only have three different auras in the deck. Um, not good. It's not good, Jeff. I tried one too and I hated it. It was horrible. Time. Yeah. I, I tried it as a fun of, and I was like, it really, I cut a cami of transients for it. And I was like, every time I was like, I wish this was a fucking cami of transients. Yeah. <laughs> the only time I'd feel better is that I play it and then they'd like use a removal spell to kill it. I'm like, ha ha, you got the, the worst of the two. Now I play cami of transients, <laughs> but cami of the, no, the kami. <clears throat> it comes back from your graveyard. So, like, why would you play yeah. this, uh, this one? It, this is not the right deck for um, uh, Light Paws. There, light Paws can be cool. Just this deck is not, it's not even, it's not. I even deck. tried just, like, throwing in the blue rune, even oh. though I could only cast it off the, get off it, Light Paws? Light Paws or cast it off the rune mm -hmm. uh, The combo. Champion. Yeah. Um, well, you can always get it with the Runeforge Champion because it makes it cost one of any color. Oh, right. So it was like, maybe just throw in there. And then I thought about the black one too, but Death Touch felt so useless that um, flying at least could conceivably win me a game. For sure. Um, yeah, so the the thing with this deck, you might have seen it, but obviously uh, Jukai Naturalist makes all your enchantments cost one generic less, and then Runeforge Champion makes all your runes cost one generic mana. So together... Mm -hmm. All of them are free, and then you're just like yeah. slamming runes and having a great time and just a, a ball drawing cards. Um, I like to describe it as the way you know when you read it and you're like, "There's no way it works like this." That's how it works. That's how it works. Because <laughs> <laughs> I also was looking at, it, I was like, "Okay, cool." So some redundancy and how to make things cheaper, uh, <laughs> not thinking of the <laughs> full potential, um, which is a blast. Because as soon as you get uh, Showdown of the Scalds to go off. And then you're just playing runes for free. It is yeah. and that showdown only costs you like three mana. Yeah, <laughs> and then you're like, oh, by the way, haste, and then they're dead because they just don't have yeah. a chance. It's it's a yeah. Good this time. deck's really cool. When it, when I was playing against people that weren't prepared for it, it felt busted. Like mm -hmm. there were a lot of games where I was just like, there's nothing you can do. Like I'm a creature deck, and you have one for one removal, but I have so much, like redundant i draw so many extra cards from all my runes and my shit and i could play so many things in a turn it i could just kill you from 14 when i had an empty board if i if i played a showdown the turn before mm -hmm. that's pretty likely that you're gonna die so it was like yeah then people caught on and there are ways to fight this deck and i will say even when i was playing in that tournament uh i lost to my own mana a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I had a slightly suboptimal mana base, but I also think there's just no way to make this deck have good mana. Uh, because you want Jukai Naturalist, which is green-white, on turn two. And you also want Generous Visitor on turn one. So you want the very specific green into white. And to make sure you can do that, you can't play many red sources. And so sometimes you just sit there with like three Showdown of the Scalds in your hand. You realize, well, 
nothing I could do here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely that just happens. That just happens. Um, and you're right, like because you the Jukai naturalist is so important to the deck that like it's just so hard to to get it to work out. Um, I was surprised. Uh, this list has two Tamiyo safekeepings, which is good. But I mm -hmm. this is the kind of deck where I'd want. A, I really like having protection spells, especially now that yeah. people are, are into it. So I would think about maybe uh, main de main decking some of those if you're. That's what I would like, but I also really like that card. So um, anything that says one mana thing gets hexproof or indestructible, I love it. So. Yeah, I don't know why this one's kind of taken over. I played this one as well, just because the list I copied did. Mm -hmm. um, but I never, I was never, pretty much never interested in protecting my auras or my enchantments with it. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it probably should just be the snakeskin veil, um, because I don't know the, the counters matter. But the only reason I like the Tamiyo safekeeping over Snakeskin Veil is because it also gives it indestructible, which means you could mm -hmm. keep one creature during a board wipe. Yeah, maybe that's it. Um, I find the board wipe that really gets you, though, is the six. The exile one. wipes everything anyways, so it's like... That's true. It's pretty easy to play around the Doomscar. That's um, very true. Because of all the haste in the deck, it's like, oh, I dare you to Doomscar. Mm -hmm. you know? Go for it. You're going you're gonna to get hit by so much next turn. That's very, and you'll very be true. tapped out. Um, but I get that too. Um, I really like Valor's stance as well, but sometimes the one mana is really important. Yes, the one mana is really important, but Valor's stance is great because most of the threats you're going to deal with in most of the games die to that, which is another reason why I think um, Iganjo, Seed of the Empire, is actually creeping up on my list of cards that I really like. Um, oh, it's, it's so good. It's so good. It's not reasonable to play around it unless you are way ahead or something. Because it's a one of in everyone's deck, so it's like it just it's yeah. always gonna be there, and there's just but there's only one. So you, if you get too scared of I, I Ganjo and start playing badly, you're just throwing a game for no reason. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's just it's just gonna get you. The and reason it's nice for a deck like this to have some removal. Yeah, <laughs> and kind of bridging into the next deck that we're talking about, but this the I Ganjo is a really great way to kill a gold span dragon because they can't counter it so it cleanly it, like you do give them treasures yeah. but you don't have the problem where you target it and then they have a chance to counter with the mana you just gave them because yeah. they cannot counter this card now that doesn't mean you should run a bunch of them but i like that interaction a lot <laughs> right. right yeah so, and i was gonna say i thought you were gonna say it doesn't let them get a treasure no well, it does uh, let them get a treasure but you don't have to deal with the all oh, right Try to remove it, counter your removal spell. Yeah, well, so it's weird. It, it It's an ability, right? So it's not a spell. So mm -hmm. it doesn't trigger the, like, target of a spell text on Goldspan. But in order to use this, you have to let it attack, is what I mean. So, like, yes, they definitely get the treasure. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you were worried about Valorous Stance, you can still do this with the treasure trigger on, this, uh, on the stack because... You let them attack, that triggers the treasure, and then you do this in response to, to the that. treasure. So they still don't have a, a chance to protect it with Valorous Stance. Uh, and like you said, they can't counter this anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, but they still do get a treasure out of the deal. <sighs> Treasures. Freaking that d dragon. But um, <laughs> So the next deck we're talking about is like a this Jeskai combo deck. Um, I am not familiar with this at all, but Jeff, you have... Uh -huh a lot of experience playing against this. Uh, I haven't really seen it. I haven't really s seen people play uh, Leer since uh, the banning of Divide by Zero. So uh, looking at this list, it's really interesting uh, for me, but can you kind of explain what is going on with this thing? Yeah, so this is what I lost to in the tournament. Um, oh, I see. That's why so you So I did it. my classic, like lose the first round and then win the next four or five. I forget what, the, I think it was five, mm -hmm. and then lose my win and in. And my win and in was against this deck. Mm. Uh, we had a great match, though, but uh, in the end, they drew a few too many gold span dragons for my liking. Uh, I was only able to deal with the first two, and the third one got me. Mm -hmm. But the deck basically plays gold span dragon, and then uh, it plays Alchemist Gambit, which is, you know, the, the, the bad Allruns Epiphany. 
but hey, we don't have an, uh, an all runs epiphany anymore, so this is our best to take an extra turn spell. It's the one with Cleave. Um, and then it just plays a bunch of dorky stuff. Like, it plays galvanic iterations to copy stuff. Um, it plays unexpected windfall is the big one because it lets you draw two cards and then create more treasure. And basically the idea is to get Goldspan Dragon down and then use all your extra mana to get Leer down and then just start cycling through your everything. Like you could like, draw your entire deck to find one of these alchemist gambits. And then you kind of generate mana by, you know, targeting your, your dragon with Valorous Stance and then targeting it with, uh, you know, whatever you want. Juari's Disruption. Or sorry, not uh, what's the other one? A spike field uh, hazard. A spike field hazard, yeah. <laughs> or, or the classic is Prismari Command from the old Jeskai combo stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and the point is all your spells are free or generate mana when you have gold span out because the ones that are expensive generate treasure, the unexpected windfall. Mm -hmm. And so that's basically it. The deck is just trying to get gold span down, get Leer down, draw through its whole deck, take extra turns, kill you. Um, yeah. It's surprising, you know, it's not bad at that. <laughs> it seems like a lot less cool than the Just Kind Mutate deck, which did basically the same thing. Um, right. It, it's sort of a modern interpretation of that built around the new idea of, like, Galvanic Iteration on an extra turn spell. Yeah. Um, interesting. It, it, it seems powerful, though, and, and definitely, like you said, a deck that I would hate. Um, any sort <laughs> of, like... <laughs> I think before the show you were talking about, you know what we we need? More is it combo decks. That's what we need. Yeah, everybody loves is it combo decks, so. Uh, <laughs> it's Splinter Twin. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> it's like that meme, is this Splinter Twin? <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it. Ugh. Now, I, I would put, I have this at tier one and it's doing well in tournaments and it's popular on the ladder. I still think of it as like a little worse than the other two decks we've talked about because sometimes it just doesn't come together. It draws mm -hmm. a bunch of fading hopes and galvanic iterations. Like anyone who's actually tried to play these decks knows how this is how it happens. Your opponent combos off, pops off on turn five and combos the crap out of you. You download the deck, you're like, that was so powerful. Then you play it and you draw like total jank the entire game. You're like, how did I lose to, how did my co opponent combo off on turn five with this pile of cards? Yeah. The thing I have to say is that don't turn three Alchemist Gambit. Just don't do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so That's I, what would happen to me. You know, I'm trying to play fast. I finally hit the Alchemist Gambit and I hit the wrong one when I'm throwing it up for the cleave. And I was, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> gosh. But. Yeah, this is the kind of... It has Smoldering Egg and all that jazz. So if you like this yeah. kind of deck where you're just doing your thing, awesome. Good for you. That's great. Um, I hope I don't get matched against you. If you're really missing <laughs> so. the days of having your first two turns, you know, bounced by Fading Hope and then they untap and cast Expressive Iteration, well, good news. That's still a thing that happens all the time in this format. So. Hooray! Yeah. <laughs> At least there's only one Holebreaker Horror in the sideboard. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, ultimately, this is a, a deck I don't love. The only thing I like about it is it plays Juari Disruption. Next. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, so those... Are, is still as, as good as it ever was, I guess. Yeah, it is. Um, but those are the three main Tier 1 decks that we were kind of thinking. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so now we get to move on to Tier 2. Uh, but, you know, Jeff, do you have any last thoughts before we go into Tier 2? Uh, yeah, I remembered that I have one tip. If I recommend people pick up the Nine Runes deck if you have the cards for it. But one thing I'm seeing a lot on the ladder, so I needed to make this point, okay. is stop, uh, stop just slapping your runes on your creatures when your opponent has a ton of open mana. Because you get really blown out for that, because you won't get to draw your card from the rune. And, so, and your creature will obviously die. The way I played this deck in the tournament is... Almost always, if my opponent held up mana, that rune is going on a land. Um, because then if they kill my creature, I still get to draw my card, and I still have an enchantment in play, which matters, uh, can matter, for the Kami of Transients and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
yeah, I just see people too, too, too often, they play something, and I'm like, okay, hey, kill that, your whole turn is wasted, and you don't get to draw your card. So it's like just a straight up two or three for one sometimes. Um, so yeah, uh, that's a good tip, is that you can put those runes on your lands, and you should be doing it as sort of a default if you're worried about your opponent having removal. And what is the best land to put it on? Creature land. That's yes. right. <laughs> Lair of the Hydra. There it is. <laughs> Uh, because when you activate the Lair of the Hydra, it will have all the enchantment buffs from the runes. Yes. So overall, this deck is actually fairly like budget when you look at it, mm -hmm. just because um, you probably have a lot of the important cards already. Uh, the main right. ones from the new set are um, they're uncommons, except for Kami of Transients, but I'm sure you can get that. So you can like leave out some of the other good lands, but make sure Lair of the Hydra is one that you do have in there. So anyway... And you don't need the new Mythic. I was playing that. I, I noticed some people aren't even playing it anymore. You don't need it. I don't think it's very good in... Yeah. It, it always it felt like... It was good in certain matchups, but um, part of the problem is now people are relying on that Exile All Enchantments and Creatures card, and so it doesn't even do the thing it was designed to do originally. Yeah, that's what kept happening to me is that it just would... I just get all my shit wiped all the time, and then right. I just and then or it would go away or so. Anyway, I was playing it for sweeper resilience, and it's not resilient to the sweeper people are playing. So. Nope, it's really bad against it. You get so just screwed. Cause <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, Jeff, let's do one deck in tier two before we go to our beer break, just so we have you know something something to, right. to look forward to. Do you have a, a preference, or do we want to just do this in the order we happen to have here? Ooh, you know. Um, I think we should skip to the second one because I, I, I do want to talk about this deck. Um, okay. Sneak it in at the first half. Uh, but this is another Jeskai deck. Mm -hmm. But this, and it's another combo Jeskai deck. I know I was talking about how I didn't like Jeskai combo decks, but I do kind of like this one. Um, yeah. Mainly because, you know, we, we, we talked about this card a little bit before. Jeff, Jeff uh, you know, it didn't really call a shot, but we, we kind of knew it was possible. But it, it's doing something, you know, it's, it's doing things. Um, so this is, uh, also labeled as just guy control, quote unquote, but it's basically Hanada combo. And yeah, like Jeff said in our first sips episode, it's, uh, Hanada Dawn crowned. And then it makes all of your cards cost less for the amount of targets. So you can play magma opus for two or as little as two. You don't have to obviously, but, um, mm -hmm. I've actually played this one because this deck seemed fun and it is wow. Having a Hanada yeah. makes all your cards so much... Like, cards you didn't even think were going to be better, drastically better. Remember totally. when we were talking about how great Valor Stance would be if it cost one mana? It does! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, this deck's really cool. The idea is that you get down Hanada and then just kind of hold. And There's often that turn where you're just like, hold hold mm -hmm. uh, and if they kill your Hanada you're like well I got nothing um, but you do have some ways to protect it uh, yeah it's a fun deck uh, it's just kind of the gold spans are kind of just in here because they're good right yeah I guess the idea is like if you don't have Hanada your cards are all expensive you're going to need the mana generation from gold spans definitely uh, to actually cast stuff but other than this Hinata shell, like it makes your Shatter Skull really uh, cheap as well. Another good one, Shatter Skull smashing, because mm -hmm. uh, that has two targets. Um, almost always, <laughs> when you play it for one, you feel kind of kind of lame. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say Prismari Command, but it doesn't really make Prismari Command too cheaper because uh, it only has one colorless mana at its cost. Yeah. Uh, Though most of the time I think like, you're trying to make a treasure token anyway. Oh, it does say target player. Never mind. So then, yeah, it would have been. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess if you were, like, looting two and treasure, you'd be targeting yourself both times, which I think is just one target. I don't know. It is, uh, yeah, because uh, the one thing with this is that if you have Magma Opus and, you, like, you want to kill a, a two-toughness creature and a one-toughness creature and send one to their face, um, it will cost three mana if you're trying to do all this right. stuff. Because you targeted one thing twice so sometimes you target Hinata yourself or, or whatever other random things just to have enough legal targets to be able to cast it on two um the thing that is really good with this deck is that when you play unexpected windfall on turn four 
your next turn, you can play Hanada with Magma Opus in your hand. And hopefully this right. is the card that helps you find it. Um, so making treasures and making sure that when you play Hanada, you also have Magma Opus is usually the way to yeah, go. Talk about cards that flew under the radar. Like Unexpected Windfall is just such a good card. It's and so good. I feel like nobody noticed that at first. It's just a common from the D&D set. Like, I didn't... It's a random common from... I was like, I don't even know what set it's from. Yeah, it's from the D&D set. Yeah, like... And it wasn't until that set championship uh, where this card really took off. Or that... No, it was the Worlds. Was it Worlds where this card kind of exploded? Yeah, it was... I think it was Worlds. Um, maybe some... Um, I think it was Worlds where it was really in the Yeah, I think this spotlight. was like the Czech Tech, right? Yeah, was it? That Andre Strosky was beating everyone with. Yeah, anyway, um, but the only reason I had ever looked at this card and thought anything of it is that Shivam, do you know Shivam? He's like a, the casual commander player. Um, but I remember on Twitter, he was like, hey, isn't this card good? <laughs> and everyone's like, Shivam, you don't know what good cards are. You're the casual Shut commander up. player. And uh, no, he's totally right. Hey. Commander card. <laughs> commander card. No, it's really good. It's a really good card. Oh, uh, turns out, man. Um, <laughs> it's it's like that card I'm always hoping they don't have you know when they sit past the turn with four mana I'm always hoping this is the card they don't have and it's always the card they have and you're like damn it now next turn's gonna be horrible because they have all this <laughs> yeah, no, freaking mana I can do because they're gonna have seven mana next turn yeah and I'm gonna have four so that's <laughs> gonna suck because I tapped out on four like an idiot <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh anyway this deck is just a lot of fun if you have the the pieces already, um, go for it. I don't know if you should craft it because um, it uh, it might have some weaknesses, but I and it's kind of expensive as far as like wild cards go. But right. hey, it's a lot of fun. But if you already have this kind of blue red shell, um, yeah, you, know, you manage to pick up a couple of Hanadas in draft or whatever. You don't want to spend a couple of tickets to give this deck a try. Definitely. Definitely recommend playing it because it's fun. But sometimes you do, you know, it has the same problem as the blue red deck we talked about in tier one, where sometimes mm -hmm. its draws just look so embarrassing. You're like, what deck am I playing right now? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think it's as quite as like has as high an upside as the other blue red deck, where when it goes off, like you can cast uh, a really cheap shadow skull smashing and then a three mana magma opus with your Hanada in play and still lose that game. Yes, you know. Magma Opus is not just going to win you the game. Whereas when the other deck does its thing, it just wins mm -hmm. a huge yeah. percentage of the time. And this also can just have the turn four you unexpected windfall and just die. <laughs> like they were just playing something aggressive and you just lost. So um, um, I feel like this is a good time to bring up, you know, right before we go to the beer break, bring up my story about this deck. So I promised to, to interject some spicy brews into the podcast. Mm -hmm. So. What I've been playing, or one thing I've been playing, is Jeskai Reanimator. So, <laughs> there's a new card in uh, Kamigawa that's like one, white, 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 and you return a permanent from your graveyard to play, and then you distribute four counters among your creatures. And what I realized is that this is the absolute perfect pairing um, for Bellomachus Lorehold, because it puts the counters on it to up its power to nine, and then it can hit more spell, like it can hit bigger spells instead oh. of just the one, the five power. Are you playing Faithful Mending? I am. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like my best card. It's so good. Um, and I also threw in a, a nice spicy one of Jingataxius to reanimate. Oh. That's always, an early Jingataxius is always nice off a treasure token. Uh, and then I have a smattering of spells just because I couldn't pick which ones I wanted. But I guess the idea is like to hit with Bellomachus, smash them in the face for nine, and then do like a Maria's Call off the top or something. Um, it's it's pretty good when you manage to hit it's, that. It's pretty good. <laughs> and then I'm playing the Wanderer and stuff to try to survive. And as other permanents, I can hit off this reanimation mm -hmm. in case I don't, don't hit the nuts. Um, but the funniest thing is that I was playing against this deck and they tap out for Hinata. And so I'm going to turn five when I was planning on reanimating. I was like, that makes my reanimation one more. But I realized that I had a treasure token, so it was fine. I could pay six for it. But the thing is, what the card actually says is, reanimate target creature in your graveyard, 
and then distribute four counters on target players. Oh, creatures. no. And so I actually couldn't cast. I was like, kept trying to cast it. I was like, why isn't this letting me? Do I not have four white? No, I have four white. What the hell's going on? And then I realized, oh, yeah, you have to click yourself because you have to clarify that you want to put the fucking counters on your own creatures <laughs> <laughs> for some reason. Commander! That way. <laughs> and so I got screwed out of And I lost that game because they untapped with like Hanada and Goldspan and all this mana when I would have won it, but that one extra mana from the weird wording on my reanimation spell. Oh my, my like, god! What's this guy doing? Because I'm just sitting there for like a minute. <laughs> Why can't I cast this? Oh no! It cost <laughs> two targets. That's so funny. And then I was like, "Well, I got to put Hanada in my deck to make this two cheaper." But again, there's only one colorless mana cost in the cost of my reanimation spells. It doesn't really make it two cheaper. It just makes it one cheaper. cheaper. Yeah. And the hard part of that card is mostly the quadruple white and not the one colorless mana that's stacked onto that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Um, do you have, like, a deck name for it, or is it just Jeskai Reanimator? I think it's currently just Jeskai Reanimator. All right. Sorry to disappoint. I'm going to keep asking you until we, like, get something. Yeah. Uh... I'll, I'll have to come up with something better. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Should it be target myself? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's probably the deck I target myself with the most. I have, like, Prismari Command. Yeah. Have, uh, you know, this card targets <laughs> myself. <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway, um, let's go to a beer break before we get to the rest of the Tier 2 decks. This beer break is brought to you by our patrons over at Patreon. That's right. We already appreciate the support you're showing us just by listening. But if you want to support the show even more, the best way to do that is by visiting our Patreon. And when you become a patron, you get an exclusive invite to our after party, which is obviously a ton of fun. It's a mini episode recorded immediately after this one where we talk about more stuff. We just talk all the time. <laughs> Plus, you get to vote on which one of us you'd like to buy a beer, and you can use whatever criteria you like best. I mean, one example, you could, whoever you agree with more on our worth of slots, boom, buy them a beer. Yeah, or, um, you know, whoever... Uh, is playing Auras. <laughs> Vote for, I yeah, guess both, both of us. us yeah, yeah. We're, we're both playing Auras now. Dang it. <laughs> Usually that one works. Um, whoever hates the uh, <laughs> the specific Just Guy combo deck, we hate the most. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Vote for that. I guess all those per, like, uh, mean both of us so you should just vote for both of us in that case so yeah i think what you're saying is buy us both a beer yes both of us a beer we need a whole round over here so go to patreon.com slash arena regulars to vote on uh on us vote us the best hosts of podcasts (laughs) (laughs) all righty jeff what do we got here i got a uh i got a prospect for you how about Uh a beer Name Prospect. Like oh. <laughs> um, so obviously this is from Left Field. It is their single hop IPA, which is single hopped with mosaic hops, which I know I do like quite a bit. So I'm expecting to like this one. It is 6.8% and uh, it's green. It's got a, we got two green cans tonight. That's right. All over the place. Um, green, green, green. This one has a baseball name for sure, Prospect. Yeah. So, Sports name, I guess. But. Yeah, so like a like a new player is a prospect, so that's what they're talking about, I'm assuming? Yeah, or like, uh, you know, someone you're trying to draft. Like right. Like a young prospect. Good prospect. Because it makes me think of like gold mining, so, but uh, but yeah, for sure, baseball. <laughs> you're thinking Skirk Prospect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh, I haven't seen that card in a long time. Please get away from me, Skirk Prospect. Skirk. And during the break... <laughs> <laughs> the break i was thinking about the greenwood name and i remembered that you know on greenwood which is where greenwood station is around mm-hmm. there is a park called greenwood park and i'm pretty sure it has a baseball diamond oh. so maybe that's actually what they were talking about and not is there also a park called prospect park by prospect road <laughs> <laughs> probably maybe <laughs> Um, most of the baseball parks so some of these baseball things like they do have like seltzers which they call their seventh inning seltzer so like Mm -hmm. there are other baseball terms that aren't just like things we don't know what they are so like trust us (laughs) it's a baseball thing like it it really is (laughs) the baseball the logo really gives it away yeah it it does but you know it could be a circle with like some kind of um uh, olive branch (laughs) 
was, yeah, it's just like a Julius Caesar yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. scene from above. <laughs> yeah, but he's like bald, but just has that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, that came out of left field. So <clears throat> let's get back I in. We said we weren't going to make any of those jokes tonight. <laughs> Did we? I don't know. Um, anyway, let's get back to our tier list of uh, decks that you may find in standard or should play in standard or uh, will play against in standard. Jeff, we're going into some more, some more stuff. What what's the next one for us? All right, let's jump right in with Esper uh, because everyone loves a good Esper deck, um, and I'm sure you're assuming that I'm about to say Control, but no, this is an Esper. Uh, it's listed here as mid range, but it even kind of has an eye towards being a little uh, aggressive, trying mm. to get under you a little bit. Yo, tell us about this deck. Yeah, so <laughs> one of the Things that's interesting. So this has a lot of those pieces that we were talking about from the Orzov um, control slash mid-range deck that we were thinking would be in that one that left. So that's the eye twitch package. Um, right. So you have that with the shambling ghast. Um, we have a bunch of wedding announcements and meat hook massacres as well. But the card that you thought was missing and the reason you thought it was missing makes sense because it's in this one. We have Rite of Oblivion right. is the name of the card we did not know from before. It's in this deck. <laughs> I think we might have said it if you take a few of the specific random things we threw out and paired them together. I think we we might have said right at some point and oblivion at some other point. Yeah. We were definitely right about right. I don't remember oh. about oblivion. <laughs> but um, yeah, it is. The, the first card on the list is uh, Kaito, which I was not expecting to see from this, um, which mm -hmm. obviously is a very uh, aggressive card in the sense that you, know, you want to be attacking to, to make it the best it can be. And, yeah, this deck will do that. Spirited Companion. Who thought that, that would make it into standard? <laughs> Not me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so what I saw, just when I first saw this deck, it's like, okay, so it's taking the black-white shell and it's cutting the expensive cards, like uh, Lulf, mm -hmm. for example. It's not here. And replacing it with some sort of cheaper cards that, uh, you know, the blue is mostly for, like you said, Kaito, but also Malevolent Hermit as a two drop to just get down early and then really kind of throw a wrench into your opponent's plans to deal with your early game threats. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I assume, no, I'm not even seeing any blue cards in the sideboard. So it really is just for those two cards and maybe Otawara soaring city. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, that's just the idea is to basically take away the expensive cards and get, get down some cheap disruptive threats like malevolent hermit and Kaito. Yeah. Um, they are both playing the the Legion Angel package, package the Legion yeah. Angel, and then taking up three sideboard slots for it, um, yeah. which I like. I think that card's so interesting and good. Um, this is also the first deck that we've really seen that plays with um, lesson cards again. So we do have like the mascot exhibition, teaching of the Archaics is another blue card in the sideboard, but you're only right. finding it that one way, um, and some of the other uh, you know uh, lesson cards. So. Yeah, and I gotta say kudos to these deck builders because I am a hundred percent a one plus three Legion Angel kind of guy, not some of these two plus twos you see Ugh. floating around. Yuck. I know, right? Like Why? That sounds Where's your courage? One plus three. Go for <laughs> Max the payoff could happen as as little as possible. Yeah, because the thing about Legion Angel, I think that's a good point. Part of Legion Angel's design feels like it's for best of one almost, you know, it's a way to like mm -hmm. use your sideboard without having really a sideboard. The same with the lesson learned thing, but it is good. And when, when people are talking about, oh, well, it takes up so many sideboard slots, it's like, yeah, but I still get to use them in the game. But the way you do that best is taking up almost all your sideboard. Don't waste deck slots with like, if you draw a Legion Angel, you want to be able to draw three more as you play them. You don't want to have totally. to draw two more. That's just the. That's not what the card's Lame. supposed to do. The card is best when you you use it one to three. So, um, that that means one in your deck, not three in your deck and one in the sideboard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think this deck is really cool. Uh, I have it in tier two, I think, because basically what it did is it took a, a really consistent, solid deck. It. Uh, turned it into a more aggressive shell and added a color, which is really going to kind of throttle the consistency a little bit. I, I haven't actually played with this deck, um, but I played against it because mm -hmm. it's fairly popular on the ladder. And sometimes it just seems like 
they just don't have the right colors. They have a lot of stuff that's white black, and then they have you know a blue two drop as well. Wandering Emperor is double white, and Kaito is blue black. Like it's it kind of tough to get your dream curve here, um, but it's it's definitely a fun deck. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's not normally what you're seeing when you, when you take a expensive deck and try to make it, uh, cheaper for aggression, you usually right. take a color out. You don't try to right. add you're another color. cutting a color, mm-hmm. not adding in a third one. So, um, it's probably just overall a little less consistent than the black white version. Uh, and I'm not convinced you couldn't build a black white, more aggressive shell that j- without adding blue, I think black white's deep enough that you could still play that game plan. Yeah. without these blue cards. I mean, but. white is definitely deep enough uh, yeah, to be exactly. able to have aggressive threats. So, um, yeah, you could definitely... You know, like, is Malevolent Hermit better for the deck than Luminarch Aspirant? I mean, it does a different... It has a different piece. Or, like, if you want, like, a aggressive threat that slows them down, you could play, uh, like, Paolo. Uh, That's true thinking something like Thalia, but you're playing a lot of non-creature spells yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, so maybe it's, maybe that's not ideal, but there are, there are a lot of options in white for sure. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it seems a lot of fun, though, like you were saying. Um, always always on for a fun time. Just like, because you brought it up, I think white's just the decidedly the best color right now. But it just, I, I love it. <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, in no small part due to the Wandering Emperor, but Hell yeah. Because it goes in like so many different decks, like we were talking about before. And apparently wedding announcement, but you know. Yeah, and wedding announcement's great too. Um, so do we want to like move into some more aggressive decks as we're kind of coming into this? Um, sure, yeah. Let's, let's talk aggro. Because we're talking about white. Let's talk about some white aggressive decks. Um, start with the, the bare bones, the main one. You know, we got mono white aggro. Mm. Mm-hmm. Love it, love it. Absolute classic. A lot of the same stuff that we've seen uh, throughout, you know, this this last set, Neon Dynasty did not give us a lot of tools besides the Wandering Emperor. Everything else seems mm-hmm. to be fairly similar. A lot of four of, so um, you have, you know, Elite Spellbinder, Luminar Gasparant, we're talking Thalia and um, Redain and Adeline. But, uh, but yeah, still good. Even though we lost um, the freaking, what is it? Faisal's Haven? Um mm-hmm. They've added, in this version, they have the Cave of the Frost Dragon, but also the Crawling Barons. I don't think I've seen right. this deck with Crawling Barons before. So, Just to talk about lands quickly, mm-hmm. you did say, you know, not a lot from the new set, but Igonjo is pretty huge, actually. That is uh, true. Because an untapped land for an aggro deck is really important, and then also not flooding out is pretty important, and Igonjo helps you do that. But yeah, let's talk Crawling Barons, because uh, I would have assumed this was too slow for an aggro deck. It really seems like it to me. Um, I can see those those turns where you like get wiped and maybe you want to deploy a bunch of threats at the same time. Because sometimes mm-hmm. if you if you have drawn like a one drop later in the game, it's like, do I play this right now? And it's just the only creature out, or do I wait until I have like three or four cards I can play on the same turn, um, so that the only way they can beat me is with uh, is with uh, like a, a board wipe. As opposed to playing into like single target stuff, so I wonder if crawling barons is just a thing to do in the interim when you're like, okay, well I can crawling barons and make something big. That uh, instead of playing my third creature right into their board wipe, I'll just attack them with two creatures plus a crawling baron. Yeah, maybe something like that, um, and like build obviously build for the late game because you can just that's going to dodge other board wipes. So I always just think of crawling barons as like the. Um, like activate it and not turn it into a creature on end mm-hmm. step thing that control players did. And then eventually it kills you rather than the, uh, I don't know, sort of raging ravine type thing where it gets bigger every time you activate it. And it's really a clock because it's, a, it's essentially five mana. You have to remember with creature lands, it's always one more than it looks like it is mm-hmm. because this thing has to attack. So, um, five is a big step up from the four and uh, that we had before and mm-hmm. faceless haven was sort of like three and a half because you could use the faceless haven after it attacked yeah we'll see i think it's really interesting that they have this in the list i might throw it into my mono white deck and, and see what's going on because i think it's worth a try but i would have i would have guessed that it's not good enough i think three might be too much for me i might try one or two to start 
Right. Um, but I'm nervous about the hands where I have two crawling barons in my open. Ugh, it's just, that just sounds horrible. Especially two crawling barons and then the like wandering emperor. And you're like, what is this? And, and Adeline. You yeah. Know, like, you're like, oh, I have it. all this double white stuff. So anyway, um, I think that's interesting, but uh, you know, we have more aggressive decks. Yeah. I did want to say, I just love the particular build we're looking at. It's 30 creatures including four Thalias, and then just two Valor Stance and four the Wandering Emperor. And I love that commitment to Thalia. Like, Thalia is going to be very good in, in this deck. Because, like, if you have Thalia and you're beating down, you probably don't need the Wandering Emperor. Um, so it's nice. It's fine to have those two in the same deck for the mm-hmm. most part. And then everything else, just, no, 30 creatures. And I love that all of the removals in the sideboard. Um they're not messing around with main deck removal, and I think I Ganjo lets you do that a little bit more than maybe in the past, where people you'd always see one or two brutal Cathars or one or two Skyclave apparitions mm-hmm. main. This is just it has those it has four Cathars and three apparitions all sideboard, mm-hmm. and March of Otherworldly Light. Uh, yeah, <laughs> really interesting. Just a one of there. Um, and I guess Valorous Stance is pulling double duty as yeah, some, uh, that, some amount of that was too. That was what I was going to say, that you do have the Valorous Stance for that, um, which is why that card's so good. Holy shit, I did not realize that this card's amazing. Yeah, Valorous Stance is a big part of the metagame, by the way. So this is another tip that I would say mostly applies to Naya Runes. But uh, don't just blindly make your creatures four mana. Because Naya Runes, you distribute a lot of counters. Sorry, four, uh, like Toughness. make them into four fours. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, yeah, the stats are mostly even in Naya runes, but yeah, I guess it, it matters with your uh, Runeforge champion not to put a counter on it if mm-hmm. you don't want it to die. But you have to do a good job of distributing evenly, and it's so interesting that you're often trying to play against, like, Dragon's Fire on three, but also not go up to four because of Valor stance that uh, really think about what your opponent's kind of telling you that they have in their hand because it, it matters how you're going to actually distribute those counters in that play. That is so... Uh, but don't just blindly go up to four and don't blindly attack into the Wandering Emperor because, uh, yeah, you, you lose real fast when you do that too. Wow. I did not think about the Dragon's Fire and Valorous Dance thing. Um, that's mm-hmm. really interesting. What a No wonder Jess Guy has like popped up a bit too because they are playing both of those cards. Right. Yeah. Um, um, Sometimes it doesn't matter because they have the gold span and they could do four with their Dragon's Fire or three. Like mm-hmm. Dragon's Fire is has some flexibility already. Yeah. But sometimes you like, oh, I'll quickly get out of Dragon's Fire range while they're tapped out, put two counters here to get up to five toughness, and then they just Valor Stance you. Mm-hmm. Like, Damn so it. that was your last card. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> I really thought, I knew it was a removal spell, but yeah. I thought it was the other one. thought it would be the other one. Um but another deck that can play both of those cards is Boros Aggro. Yes. Which is uh, and one of the cards that I really like, actually, and I'm really happy it's being played. But uh, Kumano, the, the saga, Kumano faces mm-hmm. uh, Kakazama. Or no, wait, how do you say this? Kakazan. There we go. I've never said that it's, out it's loud. It's Kakarot, I'm pretty sure. Kakarot. Um, yeah. I've never said that word out loud before. Uh, it's just always been, there, I, think, I think not a lot of people have. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, Kumano, that's cool. I liked that card from original, um, uh, Kamigawa, but you know, this is where we have the rabbit battery and, um, a couple of these other just like, oh yeah, the sun gold sentinels here. That's great. Um, do you think adding red is good for this deck or should we just keep it mon- like mono white? What did you prefer? Cause I know which one I prefer, but. I think if if I were playing, I would play mono white. Mm-hmm. Um, if I were to play a white aggro deck, but I don't know about you, but I've been seeing this deck a lot more actually on the ladder than mono white. It seems like people just really love this build. I'm a little suspicious of the rabbit batteries because you have like I don't know ten or so untapped red sources on turn one, mm-hmm. maybe less. Like, it depends if you count Fury Comp Snarl, I guess. Um, how, exactly how many, like, how, how many do you count those for? You do have a lot of planes. Uh, I would just think, you know, I'm, I'm skeptical about adding colors to aggro decks to make them, it makes them less consistent, mm-hmm. right? I think you do get some power here. Now, the build we're looking at doesn't play that much red, um, but what I've been seeing online is, for example, like, 
um, the werewolf that gives haste. Mm, That's kind of been a common one. Uh, Sometimes you'll see them playing Showdown of the Scalds, which adds, you know, a ton of power to the deck, just like in terms of raw card quality. Um, But I think I'm just on, like, let's just play Mono White, and if we want card quality, play the Wandering Emperor, you know? Mm -hmm. No, If you're worried about getting overpowered yeah i think you're right i mean like this does add i really like the kumano faces whatever on turn one into thalia feels awesome because then you have like a three two first striker which just dominates for a while if you're playing against any other creature deck but um and rabbit battery is cool like you know i've seen people put rabbit battery like on their elite spell binders and just whack you in the air for four on right away after looking at your hand and stealing something whenever you do stuff like that it feels awesome Mm -hmm. and obviously the red werewolf that gives haste which isn't in the list we're looking at but i've seen around is just a really good card um but white is so good white is so deep already that i don't think you need to splash because splashing lowers your consistency and i don't know if you get enough card quality out of it yeah i think the the thing about this deck list that makes me feel like i'm off it is that immediately it has two Legion Angel and two Legion Angel. And I'm like, no, we just talked about this. One and three. I know I don't trust you. I I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the other thing is like part of the reason I said that is that this is Sandy Dog. It's like a great aggro player. Mm-hmm. But I still, I'm still off it. I'm not a two plus two Legion Angel kind of guy. Out of here. I'm out of it. Yeah. Um, let, let's move on to something uh, completely different. Uh, we have yep. a Azorius control list. Ooh, is Azorius back on the menu? Do we can we can we play this deck? Yeah. Again? Oh yeah. Um, this is your stereotypical control deck. This is your stereotype of Azorius control, which is the kind of deck that's like on the ladder. It's probably never going to be the best choice, um, but it's the type of deck that will win a tournament if you predict the meta game right because it has a lot of tools. And control decks just need their answers to line up properly. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it just has really strong card advantage built in with Memory Deluge, just high card quality. You know, we see four of Wandering Emperor. It seems to be a, you know, I just love that we had the absolute most aggro deck in the format for Wandering Emperor. And then the absolute slowest, most controlling deck in the format for Wandering Emperor. And then the mid-range decks earlier, I think they had three yeah. Wandering Emperor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that card's awesome. What a cool, not overpowered, sweet card. You know what I mean? Totally. It just um, it just feels like it fits really nicely. I, I'm just very happy with it. Um, but, uh, yeah. I, I'm... <clears throat> You know, obviously, in my mind, control decks are Azorius, just because it feels like Gab Nassif, you know, thank you for right. your, your your years it's, of yeah. showing Maybe me. Maybe it's sometimes Jess Guy where you splash red, or Esper if you splash black, or mm-hmm. uh, even more rarely Bant, you splash some green, but mm. almost always a blue-white core. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, again, this is not the... I'm not... A player that will play this deck very much i i don't really enjoy control decks uh, uh all that much but every once in a while you know hey if you have these cards laying around and you you think of yourself as a certain type of player it is really helpful to every once in a while play like, you know what i'm gonna play the other side of the matchup just to see what it's like and uh this is the kind of thing where i would be like if i was choosing a control deck i would probably want to play azorius just because it feels so iconic so I, I'm yeah, always happy. Black control is fun too when that's a real thing, mm-hmm. but because it, it's a different kind of control, it's less like it's a little more tap out and a little less uh, always have your mana up. Kind mm-hmm. of thing. This is the kind of control deck that I love. So I, I love playing control when control is not just the most like de facto best thing in the format. You know, mm-hmm. that I find kind of less fun because you just kind of sit there and pass the turn wait to see what your opponent does and just rely on your raw card quality to always carry you through um it's it's a little less uh, fun whereas these ones i feel like when the deck is situated like this it gets you on both levels where you change your deck a little bit and then you see that change mattering and you're like oh it's cool i'm, I'm glad i put this card in and that actually mattered but also the games are usually like razor thin margins you mm-hmm. know it's like you end up beating the aggro deck on two life or whatever, or you, you beat the control deck the turn before they were really going to pop off. 
Um, so I love it when control is positioned like this. I think that's where this deck is. Um, so I'd probably I would probably play this. I mean, I think I have most most of this. Mm -hmm. I actually don't know if I have the full four wandering embers, but uh, <laughs> uh, I I think much everything else. Yeah, I I I definitely have all four wandering embers, but that was mainly from drafting. I just kept opening them. Um, but, uh, but no, it's actually funny. So Azorius, I was playing, I've been playing this. I, I don't actually think it's, this is a real name for the deck. Um, cause I don't actually know. So death and taxes, as far okay. as an archetype, usually what does that entail? Obviously taxing cards. So like you're talking about elite spell binders and things, but is it mainly, what is it? <laughs> tell me what is, tell yeah. me what it is. So I think it's kind of broadened in scope, but mm -hmm. I would consider any, I would say it, it has to be white based. Mm -hmm. um, and then any deck that is kind of playing a hate bears taxing you strategy can be reasonably called death and taxes. I think back in the day it was like black, white and it played removal spells and creatures that tax you and tried to like, it was literally death and taxes. Perfect. Okay. Um, That's basically but now I think the name just stuck on any deck that plays kind of like the Thalia game plan. Yeah, so the list I was playing is not... Uh, it actually doesn't play Thalia, which I think is probably incorrect. Um, but um, a lot of it was like the... Um, you're playing Elite Spellbinder, but the main thing that kind of drew me to it is that it's also playing uh, like four of the um, the spirit, the flash spirit, that when it enters, uh, you can pay the one in a blue to phase all this stuff out from oh, yeah. Midnight Hunt, right? Yeah. And... That was actually seemed really fun, and there's like a spirit sub theme in the deck, and so I, I was playing sort of like Noriyuki Mori's deck from uh, was it from Worlds? Or? I don't know. If, I don't think it wasn't from it wasn't that. I found this from somewhere else. I, I think it's probably a variation of that. Yeah, yeah. Probably, I meant to maybe inspired. Oh by that, yeah, probably like similar, similar to that because it's obviously more modern and has newer cards. But. Um, but you you know you're playing the Wandering Emperor obviously. Because uh, right. you're playing white and, and some other things, but it's been really fun, like uh, you know, playing the the three one, uh, the spellbinder, and then getting something out of their hand, and then uh, kind of setting up a situation where you, because you're half playing like um, luminarch aspirant to put counters on stuff, but the other half is like some controlling aspects, and then you try to chain a lot of those spirits together so you phase them out every turn, and so that you just attack through whatever blockers they have almost. Um, Kamigawa in injected spell pierce into the format, right? Yeah, so spell pierce is what was really helpful, and the wandering em emperor was really helpful, like mm -hmm. um, in between, obviously aggressive and, and uh, controlling cards. So that sounds cool. I would play that for sure. It, it's been like pretty the spectral adversary and the intrepid adversary. Mm -hmm. It was uh, it was it's been fun. So that's kind of one of the other decks I've been trying to tinker around with, but we don't have it specifically on this. But it is making me kind of you know lean closer to azorius being like oh yeah i love azorius it's so uh, yeah it's nice i mean you played auras for a while so yeah i tried it's to not like you're against the you know. no the colors on point yeah. the gameplay eh. <laughs> yeah. i have a harder time i just don't have as much fun um yeah and that's the you know the most important thing yeah um, i did want to say about this azorius control deck here though once again we're seeing these numbers creep up two of Iganjo, Seed of the Empire. Mm. They're not even playing the blue one. <laughs> so they've picked which one's better. They picked the blue Manland, Hall of the Storm Giants, mm -hmm. and the white uh, Kamigawa land as just the better ones of those two colors, and I'll play these two. Honestly, of all the Kami, like of all the channel lands, I guess that's what they're, I don't know what they're called, but I'm going to call them that. Um, mm -hmm. Iganjo is the one I've seen played the most, and I've seen Baseju come out and just be... Like, why would you, I like, I'm literally trying to activate my main land and they like blow up a thing. So I get to fetch a land. I'm like, oh, okay. Now I have enough mana to, to attack with my dragon that I couldn't kill you before, but now I have my dragons unlocked. <laughs> Thank you for blowing up that, that useless enchantment that wasn't killing you. Um, yeah. I mean, I use, I, uh, Bosage you almost exclusively to kill creature lands. Uh, yeah, it's see? like a field of ruin from my hand, and that, that's what I think of that card of in standard. It's like field of ruin that you play from your hand instead of from the battlefield. And I guess it doesn't get me... It actually costs me a land, kind of. But <laughs> yeah, but but that is exactly the way you should think about it, right? Yes. So if it's you know field of ruin that's in your hand, 
awesome. There you go. You can play it at instant speed. They don't see it coming. Um, and they can't really interact with it just like Field of Ruin. But yeah, if you're blowing up other stuff, it has to be an emergency. Don't just blow up stuff just because. You know, one of the things that feels the worst ever, and people keep doing this, and Boseju uh, makes it, must make it feel even worse, but when I'm playing Naya Runes, people blow up my Showdown of the Scalds. And it's like, I already got all four cards off it, though. Like, I could still cast all of those cards. Yeah. Uh, you're just stopping the plus one, plus one counters and giving me a land to help to me play. cast all the four cards that I'm like, you know, like, because uh, they do it right away so I don't get the counters mm-hmm. from anything. And uh, a lot of times I don't feel like my opponents had to do that because the counters, I'm going to get a ton of counters anyways, is what my deck does. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I just feel like, oh, stop, stop Bosejuing Showdown in, in particular. But I would say most, there are not that many enchantments that you really need to take off the battlefield i guess the one that pops to mind is when they flipped the wedding announcement one oh or something. yeah that, that can be pretty good yeah when glory when you, they have a glorious anthem like you can get rid of that jukai naturalist i mean you do ramp them so that's what the card does but right it's, it's maybe? a tough proposition so that's it's like the old modern debate of do you path for exile the birds of paradise and <laughs> i usually decided that i don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah because <laughs> That's interesting. I like that. I don't think I've ever heard of the path, path to exile, the uh, the birds of paradise. Hey, do you path the bird? No, but you always bolt it. Um, you always bolt it, but you never. All, you, you probably, I would say never. Never. Like, usually, I don't. Usually, path. don't do that. Um, sweet. We have two more decks to talk about, and they're both in tier three. So we finished tiers one and two. Let's move on to just yeah. like the other decks that uh, are still around, but um, maybe not uh, the the best of the best anymore. Uh, Mono green. Snow, it's still yeah. around. It's still snow, still mono green, still playing Blizzard Brawl. Blizzard Brawl is right. a fucking good card, man. Yeah. So I think, I don't know, this this maybe could go tier two. Like, people still play this a lot on ladder, so mm-hmm. it is worth knowing about. Basically, if you've been playing, you know, before the standard season, this deck is the same uh, uh, now, except it plays Boseju. Uh, and then this list really can't play is Invoke the Ancients, I guess, but... Um, I don't know if that's I, stock. I, I I think that's incorrect. I don't think you should play this card. It doesn't seem that good to me. No. But, uh, this is like the one green, 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 green that creates two, four, fives tokens. Um, it's, it's powerful, but I don't know. Is it more powerful than some of the other stuff this deck can do? Yeah. I mean, they're playing Chariot, so like... And there's so much like fading hope going around and stuff. And it's like, I don't know, like... It's also hard because... This deck's not playing Ren and Seven, for example. Like, is this better than Ren and Seven? That's what I was going to say. Like, is Invoke the Ancients is a five drop, so do you play Ren and Seven with your Seekers Chariot, or do you play this? Now, it does give you two things, so I guess, you know, as far... If they bounce one of them, then that's better, but Fading Hope feels like it's... I, it is in a lot of decks that we've seen, but is it losing favor a little bit, like... It, it's one of those cards that's going to come in and out for sure. Yeah. Fading Hope is going to go up and then down in popularity as the metagame adapts to it or forgets about it. Um, I don't know. This just seems worse than Run and Seven. And so basically, I would just say this deck's the same as it was before, but mm-hmm. with Boseju. Uh, and as we just talked about, Boseju is not like some sort of crazy addition. Um, and I guess by the same as it was before, I should mention, except no Faceless Haven. Yeah. Um, so. so other decks got better. This one actually just got a little worse, so I think that pushed it down into Tier 3, but you shouldn't underestimate it. There's still a lot of really powerful cards in this deck. Yeah, it still attacks with hasty 4-4s four and, like, big chonkers and shit, so... Um, and just makes huge board states out of yeah. nowhere. Um, so, hey, I mean, another deck that does that is Naya Runes, so... Yeah. You get to kind of decide which one you want to do. Uh, the man is a lot better in this deck, so there you go. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> Though I like that in this list we're looking at, they have uh, there's two Basejus in the main deck and one in the sideboard. So, mm-hmm. interesting. I don't know how aggressive I'm a big doing. sideboard Baseju fan, actually. I played it in my Naya Runes build mm-hmm. because sometimes I just brought it in to have more lands in my deck. Mm. <laughs> Literally, it. I didn't even care about the fact that it was Baseju. Um, but then sometimes you bring it in because you want interaction with creature lands usually mm-hmm. but sometimes uh sometimes you know whatever the odd uh 
enchantment that sneaks through. Uh, like it's decent in the mirror match because you tend to bring in enchantment removal and then you blow up that enchantment removal and then it just like everything's kind of swinging around. But yeah, I just like the idea of a land that is a reasonable sideboard card because yeah. sometimes you just want more lands in your deck. That's true. Hey, I think that that is a, you know, we should all have 14 card sideboards with one land. That sounds like what I would love that. Yeah. You know? That way I wouldn't have to keep copying people's deck lists and cutting a, something for a land every single time. Hey, maybe that's what we should start doing. That should be a arena regulars. Hey, re all you regulars out there take, yeah. the, you know, this is Jeff's tip and I have stolen this tip as well. Um, <laughs> whenever you steal a deck online, make sure you cut your least favorite card or one of your least favorite cards out of land. Always. Yeah. Do it. It's a good rule of thumb. Until you realize uh, and, that you should take it out. But always yeah. just do it. Just run it. That's your bat. default. Default. And I stole it from Kai Buddha, actually. <laughs> they used to ask him how he would win all the time. He'd be like, I play the same decks as everyone else, but I play one more land. <laughs> and Kai Buddha is awesome. So yeah. do that. Um, all right, Jeff. We have one more deck to talk about before we go to our last call and rate the beers for the evening. And I thought yeah. you should introduce this one because, you know, yeah. I mean. All right. No, no. Tier three here, we have Racto Sacrifice. Mm. I, it pains me to put this in tier three, but... Don't feel super bad, because I did say that Oni Cult Anvil is a worth a slot, so... Yeah, <laughs> but I was hoping it would be. Uh... <laughs> I mean, it's worth a slot in a tier three deck, so that's still worth a slot, right? <laughs> like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes it feels awesome, but most of the time, it just feels like... feels like... You need a little too much going your way to mm -hmm. to get this game plan going. Like you're just getting overpowered by pure card quality when you look at, for example, the black white deck, which uh, you know, let's talk about you know for sake of comparison, the one that has a lot of the uh, sack effects going on in it already. Like that version, all of the cards are just so much more powerful than the cards you're playing. Mm -hmm. um, that. There's not a ton of reason to be playing the red black version, I don't think, over black white. Yeah, no, like some of these cards are just, you know, Voldaren Epicure, really great in draft, but like sometimes just it, it seems good, but like it just doesn't really get there. I don't know. Yeah, like this deck was a <clears throat> lot better in Alchemy. What like that's what I played mm -hmm. in the Alchemy tournament because of Sanguine. Brushstrokes. 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 Brush I was like, oh, bloodstrokes. Blood Brushstrokes. Brush <laughs> I like bloodstrokes. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, like, that's the biggest, that's huge. Like, that's, that card is so good that, like, there's, it's just, you, this one is not. Uh, like, when you get both that and Oni Cult Anvil going, it mm -hmm. just accelerates like crazy because um, it doubles the effectiveness of the Oni Cult Anvil, essentially, because when whether you're sacking the artifact creature you made, that triggers the Blood Artist, mm -hmm. or if you're sacking uh, one of the Blood Tokens you made, that triggers the Brushstrokes itself. Mm -hmm. And so either way, each Oni, like, you're basically draining them. Instead of draining them for one a turn, you end up draining them for three or four a turn when you yeah. have that card as well. And so it just actually makes it more plausible, whereas this deck feels like they get their thing going and it's still just, okay, well, I have an 18-turn clock on me and you're playing a bunch of one-drops. I think I'll be able to get there. Mm -hmm. I like I would want it to, to do well, but um, it hasn't been super impressive, unfortunately. So maybe Alchemy, maybe this is more <laughs> Especially of with know, the uh, Alchemy deck. The Naya Runes deck, I always laughed at this deck on the other side of the table because it's like your meat hook massacre is going to be so far behind my creature sizes that mm -hmm. it's it's never going to matter yeah also all your tokens don't matter because my creatures have trample so and lifelink right i have a ton <laughs> of trample i have lifelink to counter your pinging i have my creatures outpace your meat hook massacre and their sizing uh i have haste if that ends up being relevant <laughs> like you're fucked like there's you, you, yeah. no you're, you're done. So. You can't out card advantage me because I have Showdown of the Skull. Mm -hmm. It's like, it, yeah, it's just, it seems like an unwinnable matchup from the Rakdos side. I will throw out, though, my other, I promised uh, a couple of spicy brews, so I have another one. I don't know how spicy it is because it's a deck that we sort of saw in the past, but I've been having some fun with 
some old school Rakdos treasures. Okay. And the big addition is at sushi, of course. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the new thing we're getting more so than anything else. And just going uh, Kalein turn two into at sushi right away actually just kind of turbocharges the deck to give it some of these draws to compete with the power of other stuff. And I'm trying like a one of of the black, the big black dragon as well. Yeah. Um, but the funny thing about that is that so many of my cards are dragons that when it dies, it says like, bring back a non-dragon creature. I'm like, wait a minute. All of my stuff is dragon. <laughs> this is BS. All right, fine. You discard two. Um, but I think also the presence of these really cool dragons makes Magda a little better. So just having that turn two Magda, Ooh. having an output for your treasures to go get something at instant speed mm-hmm. that uh, can do this kind of stuff. It's pretty sweet. Uh, I haven't gotten it to a place where, you know, it's probably similarly tier three right now, but the, there's a lot of really powerful little synergies going on that usually that means you could probably work this up to like a tier two deck, but uh, you know, if you just get the numbers right. And Dragon's Fire is a, an absolute monster in this deck because it could go up to six because I'm playing the the six six uh, from the red dragon from uh, oh uh, the 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 Inferno uh, mount yes yeah inf- some yeah, whatever in- that one that one yeah <laughs> it's another it's just there because sometimes you go get it with Magna and win the game on the spot but yeah there are so many dragons in standard right now it's crazy Inferno I, of the sky star mount. Whatever. Something yeah. like that. Star Mount. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something like that. Um, I just think it's funny that we talked about all these decks and none of them were labeled dragons because we have so many right. dragons. Uh, so it's nice to get like a little bit of that. We got that treasure, that blood money or whatever deck at the end. Yeah, I'm just going to rename it Black Red Dragons. There you go. Yeah, black Red Dragons. Right. Red Eyes, know, Black Dragons. squeeze a third color into there to try to get a, <laughs> some more dragons in there. Did you play Yu-Gi-Oh ever? Did you? <laughs> were you ever? In oh, that? yeah. The red, red eyes, eyes black, black dragon, dragon was just like yeah. objectively worse than the blue eyes white dragon. Yeah, I know it was, so it was like objectively worse than dark magician, which was objectively worse than, than blue yeah. eyes white dragon. Which is, I I, don't, I hope I don't offend any Yu Gi Oh players out there, but those were the reasons I stopped playing Yu Gi Oh and played Magic instead. Because <laughs> wow, was it very like oh this is just strictly better in every way. Why would I play right. anything else anyway? Um, Jeff. After talking about Yu-Gi-Oh, I think it's time to go to last call. That's right. <laughs> so, we have some beers to rate this evening. I've already finished mine because they're in the smaller cans. Uh, we only have the one. Tiny beers. But, all right. Have you had a moment to think? As I'm trying to talk, um, we should go through the tiers uh, that we rate our beers by so that we can have a okay. couple more moments to just decide which ones we think are best or better than the rest. So, um, as always, our our beers are ranked on the tiers in Arena, which is bronze to mythic. And, uh, hey, you know, it's just like Arena. That's nice. Don't, this is really important. We don't mean to throw any shade on anyone who is in any specific tier. That is not the point of this. The point is to have a fun way of ranking beers. So don't feel bad if you're in a specific tier that we say is suboptimal. Everyone has been in every single tier. It's just how it is. So, you know, nothing against you. But bronze beers are trash. They're horrible. They're so bad. You can't drink them. You have to throw them in the garbage and down the drain. Yuck. Silver are a step up from that. They're just kind of uninteresting. Most of your macro brews will fall in this category. Gold beers are fine. Um, you like them, you drink them, but you won't really think about them very often. Platinum are step up from that. They're solid. Uh, you'd probably drink these again, uh, but, you know, maybe not right home about them. Diamond are exceptional beers. These you would recommend to uh, your friends. You really like them. Uh, you stock them with your in your fridge very often, so you are uh, drinking these as much as you can. Yeah, I was going to say, Mythic, you stock them in your fridge instead of with your fridge. (laughs) Yeah, okay. Mythic are the absolute best of the best. You'd recommend these to anyone who will listen, and sometimes even those that won't. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, especially that one. So, Jeff, do you have one for this evening? I think I know which one. Yeah, I think I'm ready. All right. On three, we'll say the name of the beer. Three, two, one. Prospect. Prospect. There we go. 
I wanted to say I kind of screwed that up. On one, <laughs> it's gonna we, we have to say it. <laughs> I feel like you're like on three, go go. <laughs> on three, say the name of the beer. Three, <laughs> we yeah. just go. Um, anyway, sorry. Getting into the beer, so we both picked Prospect, which is the one I brought. Um, but uh, also, it doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> so it's a single hopped IPA with mosaic hops. Um, Jeff, uh, what did you think about this beer? What is, uh, you know, what are your initial tastings thoughts? Uh, I thought it would pair really well with grilled hamburgers and uh, poutine. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, as soon as I tasted it, I was like, that's for sure what I would drink. They wrote food. that on the can. On the can, they have ballpark <laughs> oh, pairings. I didn't, I didn't even see that. Mm-hmm. Wow, yeah, man. totally, for sure. <laughs> I love grilled hamburgers, too. Like, this won't pair well if the hamburger isn't on a barbecue, okay? Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, no, this this one's really nice. Uh, I like mosaic hops a lot, so I always like these single hopped uh, made with mosaics. I don't think there was anything too fancy going on here. Like, it's just an IPA. Mm-hmm. It's single hops, so these beers tend to be usually pretty straightforward, right? It's like... Yeah. Uh, Sometimes you'll even see them made with single malt. Um, it's called like smash beers, single hop and, or single malt and single hop. Okay. Um, this one I think isn't that, but uh, I, I like that. I like the really just clean and you can taste what we're using. It's like purity kind of of the ingredients, almost that German mm-hmm. approach, which is like very uh, honest about what's in there. And we're just, it's like, we're just good beer makers and we're going to prove it by making a, uh, Nothing, something that's not super fancy. Yeah, you can't hide anywhere. Right. Yeah, so um, I think I really liked this as well. I haven't tried this one before, so it was really nice to be able to... It's always fun to, to drink ones we haven't tried. I know, like I've, I've tried Greenwood before too, so mm-hmm. I don't know. That's, always, uh... that, that's a little bit of a factor with it, but um, but I also think, you know, like you were saying, mosaic hops, hops I really like, and it always makes a, a um, an IPA... I always know I'm going to like an IPA if mosaic is in it, so... I knew I was going to like this, and I did. And objectively, I liked it just a lot more than the Greenwood. So right. um, having them back to back, I know I like this for a fact better. So um, yeah, with that, I'm, it's on the border of uh, platinum to diamond. Um, mm-hmm. uh, I'm trying my best not to have the smallness of the can be part of my rating. <laughs> yeah, because that if I can just get a pint, like a regular pint of this. It would probably be diamond. So I know what my rating is, though. I I I got to put this in platinum. Yeah. And part of that too is that um, I just know we're gonna get a lot bigger, fancier. You're right. You know, more flavorful stuff mm-hmm. from this brewery. So I don't want to jump in and give this like diamond plus and then everything mm-hmm. else. Like, oh wait, I've squashed my rating. It's been too much. Yeah, yet. you're right. You're right. Like ultimately. I, I talked about how I really like these smash beers, but it is hard to pierce, penetrate into the diamond and mythic categories with them, right? Mm-hmm. Because you've had stuff like this before. You're right. Yeah. But the, the, yeah. Okay. So it isn't like, exce- like, yeah, yeah. It, it's definitely the IPA. It's really tasty yeah. though and crisp and like, which I liked. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Platinum. No, you're right. You, you, you sold me on that. So platinum, um, with his next beer, I thought, you know, with Greenwood, we could, uh, Pair it with some spicy Italian sausages and pepperoni pizza, mm. maybe. Yeah, good, good call. Good call. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Basically, they they think it goes well with sausage. But, yeah, uh, <laughs> which I don't spicy agree. Spicy Italian sausage. Which I don't agree with at all. This would be a horrible beer to drink with spicy Italian sausage. In my mind, I never like drinking. Sorry, this is a completely different tangent, but I don't like drinking IPAs mm-hmm. with anything that's spicy because the. The hop flavor is so strong that it attacks your tongue that if I have spicy food, it's really hard to drink hoppy beers. So beer in general is like uh, one of those things where it'll make eating spicy food spicier, like harder mm-hmm. to tame. Um, you know, it's not like drinking milk or something. Yeah. Which, you know, gets rid of the spice. So maybe they're saying that it's maybe they're thinking it's the opposite of what you're saying. It'll accentuate that spice or something. But I find, like like you, I, I find if I'm eating spicy food, I'll usually have something as close to a crisp lager. Yeah, as, the coldest, crisp thing I can right. find. That's what I want. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, and not necessarily because it ruins the food, but I, it ruins the beer. Yeah. If I'm if I'm picking something big and strong, just like it usually means I don't want to drink the beer right now because it hurts, and so then I'll wait, and then the beer gets warm, and then it ruins it. That's usually what happens right. in my experience. So yeah, and warm and flat. It's warm and flat. So. Um, but just with that aside, that's just on the can. That was just a funny thing. But um, no, you're right. Bronze. Bronze. Fuck this beer. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, green one's fine. It's good. Um, it, it's a really solid IPA. They make a good one. I, I would tell people like, yeah, it's good. You know. So, uh, but that really makes it gold in my mind. That like. Yeah, this one was harder to rank for me because I was like, oh, I don't know, is it gold? But then I liked Prospect so much better, and I was sure Prospect was platinum. Yeah. So then so it felt like I have to put it as gold. It's just like yeah, it's good. It, green was good, and and you know, it's certainly true that I won't really drink this often. No, uh, you know because there are just better beers out there for this price range. Yeah, and it's also just like if I go to a bar and like <laughs> they have Greenwood, I'll be like, sure, if it's there. But like if there's something else, anything else around it, I'll probably pick whatever the other things are. Like, I it, it's 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 fine totally. it's fine like it's and that's it's, probably the definition of a gold it's beer. very acceptable you know it's it's a beer yeah. that's good um if people say hey is this a good beer i'm like yeah it's yeah it's good but yeah. um for people at home if you've had you know um one of these sort of i don't know exactly what style of ipa you'd call it i, th- I think of this as sort of like a, a west coast kind of ipa mm-hmm. but that distinction doesn't mean the same thing to everyone but basically you've tasted a beer that tastes like yeah. this if you've had their sort of right now we're s- IPA. if anything it's like low platinum like it is definitely it's a right. it's it, so it is hard no you're right you're right it is we have rated some things gold that are like not at this level so it's iffy but i think i'll still put it in gold but yeah, yeah i think it's it's like both are on that border that we it's, talked about and mm-hmm. we just went under on them. Exactly. All right. So we got a platinum, we got a gold, we got some more stuff in store for you. So keep uh, tuning in for our uh, left field brewery. What is it? Tab takeover? That's what it is. All right. Yeah. That's what it is. But it's time for closing time. So if you want to reach out to us, tell us what your favorite left field beer is or what your favorite IPA is or, oh my God, you're fucking wrong about Greenwood. It's the best beer ever. Please reach out to us at Arena Regulars on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. Also look for us on MTG Arena. We'll be under the username Arena Regulars Podcast, probably playing some sort of wacky standard deck. Yeah. Whatever, you know, every time Jeff brews a deck, I try to steal the the list from him so I can also play a wacky deck because I don't make them myself. Um <laughs> If you want to talk to me personally about how terrible my deck building skills are, <laughs> you, you can find me at Zulberg. That's Z E L B E R. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I got confused. <laughs> I was like, "Am I just spelling my last name?" Yeah, I am spelling my last name. It's at Zulberg. That's Z E U L B E R G. But Jeff, where can they find you? Uh, they can find me uh, also on Twitter at Blues Brews MTG. Uh, where they can tell me that I should stop building my own decks and just copy the good ones. <laughs> oh, we had some small beers tonight, but they are hitting me harder than I thought. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, iTunes. Follow us on Spotify and review us there as well. Um, it really means a lot to us. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're going to get some more things up there. So um, just uh, tell us what you think. Uh, we've been seeing all your replies and your, uh, your comments. So it really means a lot to us and we would love to, to talk to anyone we can. This has been the arena regulars reminding you that if your opponent is showing too white, white, you may want to think twice before you hit that attack all button. Good night. All right. That's fine.